everyone. It's Stephanie with The Patient Store. I hope you're doing well today and really excited to introduce our special guest today for this conversation. Uh, we've got Michelle. Uh, Michelle, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm excited to be here and talk about my story. And I know so many people will, will benefit from hearing all about what you've gone through and so appreciate you stepping up to share it. Um, I know you're gonna share your story uh, with AML today and your experience through both first line treatment and then having to go through treatment again after you relapsed. Um, but as everyone can see, you look beautiful, looks like you're doing well. And so I can't wait to you know, talk about this. But before we jump into that part of your story, I always like to ask, uh, you to introduce a little bit about yourself outside of the cancer context, because as we know, we are so much more than our diagnosis. So what would you like people to know about you? Um, so I'm Michelle. I, I'm from Connecticut. Um, I enjoy just being outside, um, love going to the beach. Um, and also I love playing sports. Um, I play basketball and soccer, um, just like being active and healthy like eating. I love to cook as well. So those are kind of some of my hobbies. Love it, love it. Thank you for sharing that um, with us. Um, and so you're, I know you're young. Um, your, your first diagnosis happened when you were just 24, but let's rewind even a little bit past that. Can you tell us what were those first symptoms? What got you to understand something's not right here? Yeah, so... I would say like throughout high school, even college, I never used to get sick at all. Um, but prior to that, um, a couple months before my diagnosis, I started getting sick. I had a lot of like sore throats. Um, I went to the doctor probably at least like five times, the doctor at work, primary care, um, and pretty much they just would give me like Claritin. They were like, oh, you're fine. Just like sore throat. And I was extremely tired, but at the time I didn't realize it. I thought, oh, like I'm just hanging out with friends, like just doing all these activities. I'm work, I'm overworking myself. So I didn't really think anything of it. But when I like look back, like all the symptoms were there. I had shortness of breath I remember like walking to my car I'd be out of breath or I go into I went to work one day and I was there for an hour and I was exhausted so I ended up going home and just sleeping the afternoon and then the key kind of point was I I would get like little bruises on my body and I was like oh like I must have ran into something not a big deal but I was itchy and a, this separate from the diagnosis, um, I ended up having scabies uh, and I would itch myself. And then before I went to get my lab work done, I itched myself so much. I was bruises all down my legs, on my back. And that's when I was like, I need to go to the doctor. So those are kind of just the symptoms I experienced. Right. And not realizing at the time what they all added up to my diagnosis. I mean, it's hard, right? Of course, in retrospect, it's easy to draw the lines and connect the dots and be like, oh, that's what that was. But in the moment, it's so easy to explain away every symptom, right? Um, and I think so many of us experience that. Um, I know high level, you had overall in this time when you're trying to figure out, you would go to urgent care, you went to the doctors twice at work. You went to your primary care for getting sick, um, as you were describing, mm -hmm. you know, people saying, oh, it's fine. So um, what was the final straw that led to, okay, this is really serious? That's what, uh, yeah, the itching on my like legs and the bruising showing everywhere. I remember it actually was the day after my 24th birthday. Um, so I went to get my lab work done at a quest and they had it um faxed to my like doctor and he was like yeah your counts are just completely off um so i went to the emergency room that night 
Um, and just and to clear, it. just to clarify, you said the blood counts were extremely off. You mentioned it was an extremely high white blood cell count and low hemoglobin. Is that right? Yeah. Um, like the white blood cell, I feel like was was three times the amount of a, a normal person, and then my hemoglobin was like three times below in the opposite. And I, like I think they don't normally see the white cell go that high, so that part was. Um, interesting. But yeah, I got immediately put, was in the emergency room. And then that night, I remember they gave me two bags of blood. Um, they didn't really know what was going on. So I slept in the emergency room that night and then went up to um, the hot, like a wing in the hospital to stay. And then post that, they thought I had Lyme disease. They weren't sure. So then a couple of days later, I had a bone marrow biopsy and then the results came back and I got sent up to the hematolo or hematology wing. Um, and then post that, I got transferred to another hospital um, to kind of get treatment there. I know that um, recalling it is very, it's like this quick summary, but as you were going through it, I'm yeah. sure it felt like forever, maybe waiting for answers mm -hmm. right usually really like maybe the toughest part is when you don't even know what you're dealing with um yeah can you describe how you were able to you know sort of mentally get through waiting for the test results um and getting transferred from here to there in the hospital yeah I almost like when I was first diagnosed or when it was first happening I was like oh like I never get sick this like is minor like it's not gonna be a big deal and then like the Lyme disease, I'm like, oh, that's like interesting. Like maybe I got bit by a tick or whatnot. And then at the point where they did the bone marrow biopsy, I didn't even, I didn't realize what even the test was for. So my thought process is still like, oh, I just like don't know what's going on, but I can't imagine it's bad. But I like still do remember him telling me I had leukemia, like. I still, yeah, sorry. <laughs> like my mom was there and I just like almost, I didn't realize leukemia was blood cancer even too. I didn't know much about it and it just, yeah, it was hard. But also like the doctor treated actually my uh, different form of cancer, but my grandparents too. So it's nice to have like the familiar, familiarity with him not that I was around that much but he treated my loved ones as well so that was yeah I remember like him be, uh, I don't know this is like obviously a little superficial but I was like my hair like I'm not gonna have any hair uh that was a huge reaction and when I got moved from the normal wing to the hematology wing it was just so much nicer and I was like oh like this is like I didn't even realize the impact of having again the cancer like I was told that I had leukemia but I was like oh why is this also so much nicer this probably isn't a good thing but um my parents were there so it was so nice to have them I like don't I think my mom wanted to sleep there and I was like no you live we live like a half hour away. I don't want, I don't want you to sleep there. Like they came every day, which was super nice. And my other family members came too. But I also remember too, just texting my like friends. I think I was going to see them or something. And I was like, oh, I, I can't. And I was almost like, oh my God, should I tell them this? Like, a part of a huge part of like being sick for me is like I don't want I know obviously the general reaction is people are going to feel bad but I don't want someone to feel bad for me you know um so I remember text starting to text some of my friends and they were super great about it like they were like we won't I was like if you want to tell people like slowly over time I did it like you can tell people. Um, but then I 
so going back to the hospitalization, um, found out I was going to be transferred to Yale, which like great for care wise, everything, um, a little hard too, because it's just far away from where I live, like quite over twice the distance. And the hard part too, for me, again, with family is my parents obviously came to see me every every day when I was treated um so it's just a little hard on that part but so mentally I yeah it definitely was tough just like the shock of it I was like I'm I'm 24 years old and I've never get sick this is just I just can't believe this is happening to me um yeah no I mean from going from your experience of being super healthy and never, you know, being in the hospital to all of a sudden, you know, actually, I, I would like to ask that moment, um, what did the doctor say to you with the diagnosis? And was he or she like gentle about it? Um, you know, what was that like? They were super supportive. I remember there's, there is, I think there are, they were residents or fellows, but the three residents were around me. And then the doctor was, and he like, eased into it, grabbed my hands, like my mom. Oh, I think actually my mom was on the phone. Sorry. Um, but she came shortly after that's where I'm. So she's like, do you want to call your mom or anything? And I said, yes. And like one of the residents was like around my, like a little bit older, maybe around my age. And she like took my, like afterwards when I like started crying, she like took my hand and stayed with me and was like super sympathetic. Um, but no, his just approach was, I mean, as easy, like, how can you tell someone something so hard, but his approach definitely like made me feel comforted and having those people around me. And she stayed afterwards too, which was good. So we could like chat about, um, other subjects just to like get my mind off things too. Do you, um, I know that the emotions came up. I mean, three years ago can probably feel both like a long time ago and not that long ago at the same time. Um, can you describe what's coming up for you when you're recalling that moment? Yeah, obviously, um, you heard it in my voice a little, I got like, it's like, I'm very much comfortable now with my diagnosis. Um, again, back to like telling new people, sometimes I have a tough time and that's something I struggle with today just because I don't want people to pity me almost. Um, but like thinking about it, it brings up like the memories of what I had to go through, you know, or what I had to put my parents through. That's That's our part. Sorry. <laughs> no, I appreciate you um, being vulnerable and sharing. It's, it's really the part I, I'm getting from you is just, um, it's it kind of amazes me too. If I, I've heard other people talk about it. It's like that moment you're not even thinking about yourself, but you're thinking about the impact on other people, which I think is incredible. Um, so I appreciate you opening up, Michelle. Um, you know, before I move on to um, the next section, I am curious, you know, you talked about how you were able to break the news to your loved ones, both family and friends. Do you have any um, sort of guidance to other people? Because I mean, you're dealing with such a big piece mm -hmm. of news yourself and then, getting tasked with breaking the news is a whole nother job <laughs> yeah as I said like definitely in strides it's obviously like a super heavy conversation to have but and I also like broke it up to like my my parents obviously were the first ones to find out and I had like them kind of tell my family just because like even I remember like when I was texting I was like each text, I like, just don't even, I was just so emotional to send the text that I was diagnosed, like brought it like back further. So I was like, I'll have my parents tell them. And then I remember I was like, just texting like some of my friends. So I like 
texted them and I was like, didn't say like, I only texted a handful of them, if that makes sense. And then later on as the weeks progressed, um, and I felt more comfortable and like some came to visit me. I was like, oh, you can tell like other people too. And it was nice. Like the first week when I was there, my like home friends were the, who live around the area. Um, I texted them and I was like, it's fine to tell everyone else. And they came and visit me in the hospital, which is like a nice, it just like made, made me happy. And like, they were so supportive too. And even like my college friends that like slowly progression onwards. So it's not too overwhelming. So like back to when you tell people it, it definitely is. I do remember times when I would have like 20 text messages in my phone. It was just, even though I tried to like extend the process, it, it's almost at the point where now people feel the need to reach out to you even more. So it gets even more overwhelming, um, but just like they understand that you're not responding back for maybe days, you're like going through treatment or just you can't talk on the phone all the time, like you're tired. Um, so I think definitely taking it in strides and kind of like segmenting out, like I had my like work friends and my um, family and then having them tell each other so I don't have to feel the need to tell everyone about my diagnosis. I, I love the way you describe it too, because um, it is a balance. So you describe the joy that you got from having visitors. And of course, um, we don't know what the situation will be like in terms of visitation for a lot of people with what's going on. But yes, uh, considering, let's just, you know, say that things are back to normal, the visitation, it's great. But at the same time, everything the messages and the visits can get overwhelmed yeah. <laughs> it's like a two two-sided stone like you have the benefits of like I did feel so much love like having everyone text me but then again like I just couldn't respond in the moment but I know they all care it, it really does show you like who who really cares about you and who loves you and you are supported by, like, I have such a great family and friend support system. Like it mentally, it, it just meant everything to me. Um, I think that's so well said. And, you know, you said something about you couldn't really reply to everybody and it could get overwhelming. And what I loved and what I sometimes, you know, I don't like to give advice per se, but something that I'd like to share helped me was tell like if, if someone would just say, Hey, no pressure to respond. And then whatever they wanted to write, you know? So it was like, they would still show me that they care and send me yeah. these messages, but would also preface with totally know that you are mm -hmm. dealing with a lot and yeah. don't take your energy to respond to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> because they understand too. Like exactly. Yeah. Um, well, awesome. And I know, so your, your diagnosis was acute myeloid leukemia or AML. Was there anything before you started treatment that your doctor shared with you um, more in terms of um, what it meant to be diagnosed with AML? And, and in the next segment, we'll talk specifically about the treatment, but treatment aside, did, did they say, this is what this means? As I mentioned, I like didn't even really uh, know what type of cancer leukemia was. Um, they actually got like medicine wise. Um, so I was like pretty, just wanted to know, understand my diagnosis. Um, so obviously being blood cancer, but they got into like the details and like when they're talking about it, they're still obviously doing tests. Like there's different subtypes. You can have different mutations. So all that medical jargon, they, they went over they explained to me, they also talked about what could happen in the future. For example, like fertility issues is a huge one with chemo. They talked about a transplant because not everyone who has AML gets a transplant. Um, so kind of just like next steps going forward of treatment plans and then just an understanding of what leukemia is. Um, and I kind of wanted more information too. So like I guess, depending on the patient. 
but I thought it was extremely helpful just to understand. Also, I do remember this line. Um, he was like, because a huge one was, is, is it genetic for me? Um, both my parents and grandparents, none of them have leukemia or blood cancer, other cancers, but um, so he was described as it's almost like a car crash, like you won't know if it's going to happen. So that was like a big one for me, just like, just to understand my diagnosis more, which is still like, obviously hard. It's not an answer, but I mean, it, it does make, it does. I don't know if it was also helpful for your family to hear, right? Because I think one of the most emotional parts for me when I was getting diagnosed was seeing my dad get emotional, wondering that very question. Mm -hmm. I had, I had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and it's, it, you know, it's just, there is an impact there, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, it, and so I think you bringing that up is, is going to connect with a lot of people. Um, and uh, I'm so glad that you got the support that you, you know, you, you needed at the time with all the family around you. Um, and by the way, um, the issue of fertility is so, so important. And we will be talking more about that in the segment four. So mm -hmm. um, for anyone who's interested, just tune into that one. But uh, what we are going to be talking about next is your first line treatment. So I know it was chemo. Um, we'll talk about the side effects. Um, your stem cell transplant, and also a chemo pill. And so that's coming up next for uh, Michelle's story in segment two.